cost. Desegregation was always done in terms that benefited the white power establishment. Broke you down, but take your best to make us strong and eliminate the competition. For decades, historically black colleges and universities were a haven for African-American players, particularly Southern black players who weren't allowed to play for schools like Alabama, Florida, or Texas. While HBCUs had limited financial resources, their teams regularly featured some of the country's best players. Come on, come on. Integration changed all that. In American society, integration takes place in the hands of white institutions. Major college football integration begins to look like that in the sense of sort of, you know, not bringing HBCU teams into your conference, but instead just sort of allowing more and more elite black players into your programs and not caring that HBCU programs might suffer or eventually die because of that. HBCUs had always been part of what made college football great. Black colleges started playing the game in the early 1890s and by the 1920s produced stars like Ben Stevenson, a devastating running back for Tuskegee. Like the sport as a whole, HBCU football was dominated by high-powered coaches, Hall of Famers like Jake Gaither at Florida A&M and Eddie Robinson at Grambling, the first college coach to win 400 games. In order for us to have success, you got to put strength on strength and let weakness go to hell. Now, this is what you're going to have to do. And they were able to draw on an immense pool of talented players. Let's get off. Let's get off. When you're talking about historical black college, they never got the do that they so rightly deserve. You can't tell me the players that we had to come out of the historical black schools was not better or as good as the guys back in those days who was thought of as Heisman Trophy candidates. By the 1960s, it was impossible to ignore how good HBCU football had become. In 1963, the Kansas City Chiefs took Grambling's Buck Buchanan with the first pick in the draft. And over the next 15 years, more than 500 HBCU players were drafted, including some of the best players in pro football history. Alabama, all the schools in the Southeastern Conference who were saying that, you know, blacks weren't good enough to play, which is why Grambling was loaded, why Texas Southern was loaded, why Prairie View was loaded, why Tennessee State was loaded. The first time that ball is snapped, you got to knock hell out of him and let him know one thing, that boy, you going to be in trouble this evening. And the type of ball player you are, you should try to take his head off his shoulders. I mean, you know, I mean, this was an era when Grambling was producing more players in the pros in Notre Dame. This was a golden era for black college football. In 1968, HBCU football felt poised to cross over into mainstream prominence, and Grambling and Morgan State ventured up north for the first time to play a game in the country's biggest market and most famous stadium. I was one of uh, three freshmen who made the Morgan State football team. And this was like a this was like a huge deal. To go into Yankee Stadium, my first college football game, we went through Harlem, it was just a whole thing. And you gotta remember 1968, Dr. King got assassinated. There were like riots everywhere. This was a time Everything, whether it was a football game, a battle, everything was about race. And it flowed into everything you did. So we all knew that there was more at stake. And I remember we went out there for pregame warm-ups. And there was like, you know, people were just coming in, it was just milling in. Big Yankee State was kind of empty. And so we said, oh, man, OK, well, you know, what's this about? But it was still just a big deal just to be there. 
Then we went back inside, you know, to put our stuff on and all that. And then it was time to go out. And I remember going out and all of a sudden, the place, there were 63,000 people there and it was unbelievable. There was like the Grambling Band, the Morgan Band. And when we came out, the place went nuts. And none of us had ever seen these many people before. And these are all black folks in the stands. It was remarkable. It was the most emotional moment I'd been a part of because people knew that this was a big deal, not only for us, but for black college football. It all merged. This was a black, black power, black pride, black consciousness. And the fact that we filled it up, we sold it out. And we had put on this great show. But just as HBCU football was finally getting its moment in the sun, the foundations of its success were about to be eroded by desegregation. We, we talk about this celebration of the Morgan Grambling game and how great it was because all this talent was on display. Well, that was great, but it also became a problem, and that became, you know, the, the beginning of the end of this sort of black dominance. Tell the back where he's right, going, Jim. Right, let's go. All right, let's go. All right, come on. Hurry. And all these great players, we kind of had to ourselves. Now, all of a sudden, you began to be recruiting against institutions that you really couldn't really recruit against, all these big white institutions. Rutley, outside from Nathan. By the end of the 1970s, the starters on Bear Bryant's formerly all-white Alabama team were 40% black, and he'd won three more national championships. By 1979, the handwriting was on the wall. It was over. The more the previously all-white schools integrated, the less the top black players across the country were drawn to HBCUs. The era of great HBCU football was done. Since the decline of HBCUs, college football has come to be dominated by formerly all-white schools of the South. Twelve of the last 13 national champions are from the South. And the irony is, it's all been accomplished with players they resisted allowing in for so long. It's going to be black labor, white wealth. We're going to take your best, your most valuable people, and put them into our institutions to make us stronger and at the same time, make yours crumble. And that became the model of integration. All we're asking you, to give it what you got and try to do what we know how to do. Now let's get after it. Come on, let's go. 